the research I intend to do under the guidance of uh, Professor Bile deals with the question of whether and when the relationship between the politician and the journalist and the publisher or owner of the media outlets is criminal. When referring to the criminal relations, I mean the trial of the thousand that is going on these days in Jerusalem District Court, as we are speaking. But before I say anything about it, I want to address the both sides of the argument of whether such a relationship should be considered criminal. To be more specific, the relationship between politician and journalist, or between politician and the many media owners, <coughs> is based on the notion that the politician give the story and the journalist tell it. The problem is when the politician give a unique story to the journalist, something we call a scoop and the politician wants to get for that unique story good coverage or coverage that will, he or she will control the story. In short, the question may be, who controls the story? So when does the law fac factor into this kind of question? If we look again at the Jerusalem District Court and read the indictment in the thousand cases, we will find that the criminal charge Prime Minister Netanyahu is accused of is guaranteeing commercial, commercial benefits to the owner of the news websites and being in conflict of interest with another owner. And for what? To get unusually good coverage from them. So what is the difference between the normal relationship between journalist or media owner and politician and the relationship that leads to the filing of indictment as, as is in tandem cases? This is the central question of the research. Apart from that, there is the question of what are the disadvantages and what are the advantages of a policy that allows for filing charges for these types of relationships. In relation to my lecture, I would like to give a brief, a, a brief summary of the thousand cases. The trial began in May 2020. The defenders are Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who is going to be Prime Minister of Israel, Noni Moses, who is the publisher of Yediot, and Chaul and Iri Selovich were, who were the publisher of Walla website. The main charge against Netanyahu is that he used his power and authority to give favors to Elovich and to give him unusually good coverage in Walla news. The second main accusation is a deal made by Moses and Netanyahu in the following way. Moses will change the critical manner in which Yediot deals with Netanyahu, his return will support a law that, it, that would limit the circulation of Israel Yom, which is the Yediot major competitor. To summarize, there are two main claims related to the relationship between politician and journalist. The first claim is that Netanyahu faced a conflict interest in his public rule in his relationship with Moses, and the second claim is Netanyahu received a bribe from Elovich. As I said before, the trial is still ongoing these days. So we cannot talk about the court's verdict, but there is another decision that other courts have given on a similar legal question. The first decision is from the district court in Tel Aviv, in the case of Shimoni, who was the mayor of Ashkelon. Shimoni was accused, among other things, of accepting a bribe to shut down a news site that was against him. In the end, Shimoni was not charged with this claim, but Judge Limor Margolin drew a line when a relationship between a politician and journalist and a publisher or owner of the media is criminal. Margolin wrote five tests to know if the relationship between a politician and journalist and a publisher or owner of the media is criminal. The first test examines whether the media is owned and in intended that is outside interest, economic in general and with the elected official in particular. The second test examines whether the media has a clear agenda in matters concerning the public. The third test is checking the context of the media and if there is a clear interference from the politician. The fourth test examines how the politician intervenes in the media. And the fifth and the last examination examines how long the intervention of the politician lasted. In another case, the Supreme Court judge its Kakamit wrote a passing remark in the judgment about relationship of this type that we are talking about. This was in the appeal of Deputy, Deputy Minister of the Interior, Faina Kirshenbaum, former Deputy Minister of the Interior, Faina Kirshenbaum, who was sentenced to 10 years in prison, among other things, for accepting bribes. Kirshenbaum appealed to the Supreme Court, and Judge Amit wrote that an elected official has a clear interest in media coverage of his activities. All the most 
synthetic media coverage. And before us is another example of the varied faces of favoritism. In conclusion, we saw that there was one decision from the courts that gave a clear reference to the question we are talking about. Only the, uh, the court decision in Shimoni case. In the last few minutes, I, have, I want to raise before you both sides of the argument of a policy that allows for, allows for the possibility of criminal persecution of relationship between journalists and politicians. I will start with the argument in favor of what I think should be referred, referred to us as justification of allowing for this possibility that the relationship between journalists and politicians will be considered to be criminal relationship. If we look at the protected interests that crimes of bribery and fraud and breach of trust come to protect against, we will find that we want to protect the public from public corruption and keep the work of the public summit as clean as possible. <coughs> Professor Edwin Sutherland wrote that the reason why corruption is defined as such a serious offenses is because it's violated the basic idea that all the members of society are equal. Public corruption give give an improper advantage to the guarantor of the forbidden pleasure benefits. Now, we must take the injustice that such a relationship creates and examine it. Professor Darren Abbott wrote that the term political, political corruption is broad enough and one of them is related to the work of the press. If, for example, the media does not provide the public with a true report on the political reality and instead provides a false report to promote the interests of politicians or businessmen, we can also call it public corruption. Another justifi justification is based on the question of what journalism is and the role it takes on the public debate. One of the main aspects and one of the core values of the press is to communicate the real reality to the public and reflect the work of the policy makers. Media researchers think that the media has a strong influence on the political agenda and the way in which the policymakers choose to design policies. Because of this, and because of the unique place that the media occupies in the formation of our public discussion, and more importantly, because of the role of the media in enabling a public discussion, it should, it should, it should do so based on facts and not on assumptions. Filing an indictment for a criminal offense against someone who willfully prevents the media from doing its job can be justified down to the protection of democracy. Another justifi justification is based on the fear that because of the amorous power of the media is in shaping the public's worldview, there is a fear that corrupt deals between a journalist and politician could lead to a situation where power is bought for money. To clarify the argument, I will, to this argument, the last argument, I will state what, the, what was written in the indictment in the thousand cases in loose translation. The defendants knew that the media coverage of the two news sites could improve the news coverage of Netanyahu during the, ele the election crowd in Israel in 2015. So we can learn from the sentences how, how much power the politician attributes to the media outlet. In, in this part, I would like to briefly raise the argument against the policy that allows for the possibility of considering a criminal ch a charge between journalists and politicians to end politician. The first difficulty that arises from the cases we are dealing with is whether, as writing in the indictment, an exceptional response to the demands in connection with various publication of news items in exchange for regularity benefits or law that would be passed that would benefit the media can be called bribery in terms of the legal analysis. The second difficulty which such a policy is to see such behavior as a conflict of interest. The difficulty stems from the reason that journalism, it is core, is based on exchange between journalists who tells the story and the source of the story who gave the story, <coughs> which for us in the case is the politician. So what is the difference? The third difficulty is the judge lack of expertise to rule on such cases and to write a ruling based into the legal definition. The fourth and most difficulty is the danger of the freedom of expression where be any meeting between a journalist and politician may lead to the filing of indictment, this fear may sound like an ex excess use. But I can tell about a conversation that was a journalist friend whose story was rejected by the editor-in-chief at his place of work. 
Why it didn't get a real answer, it dug and Lenin of the intervention of a politician who prevent the, publica the publication of the story. At that point, he stopped asking questions for the fear of finding himself in the interrog interrogation room. So it has a chilling effect. And yet, after discussing argument in favor and against a legal policy that allows for the possibility of criminal prosecution of the relationship such we're talking about, there is another aspect that I want to talk. And I'm talking about the alternatives to the criminal procedure, especially when we talk about the media, which was a unique ethics coach who was proposed to deal with ethical and moral questions in which journalists are involved. The first alternative is establish, establishing an office of communication, such as we have in the United Kingdom, that will be responsible and provide a regulatory oversight of the media. The main idea is that the office is free from pressure from the involved, involved government and is built on the professionalism of employees without pressure from politicians. In the context of the thousand cases, the charge in the various cases directly relate to the consideration that Elovich and Moses were supposed to receive from Netanyahu in the form of major approval between Bezik and Yes, or passing a law that will prevent the circulation of Israeli Yom newspaper. On the assumption that there was an independent media authority that cuts off the possibility of the politician to guarantee a return, like what we allegedly promised in the cases, it possible to be that the charge in the cases would have been avoided. Another alternative is to use the ethics courts of the Council of Journalism and file an indictment against the journalists to get involved in the ethical issue, such a corrupt relationship with the politician. For example, I can quote from the New York, the New York Times called Ethic, that wrote something like that. Staff members may see source informally over a meal or drink, but they must keep in mind the difference between legitimate business and person, personal friendship. A city hall reporter who enjoyed a weekly round of golf with a city council member, for example, risks creating an appearance of coziness even if they sometimes discuss business on the course. So does a reporter who joins a regular card game or is a familiar face in a corporation uh, box sits or who spends weekend in the company of people or she or covers? Social practice requires that predictably to keep back and take a hard look at whether we have drafted too close to sell that we deal with regularity. So we can see that the media owner is aware of the difficulty such a relationship can create. However, the main problem with the code of ethics and moral obligation is that no one promised to enforce it. The third alternative is to take its taken form for this law. Professor Amir Licht wrote in a new article that will be published soon that the states can use legal tools, of, legal tools of fiduciary law to fight against corruption. The potential, but the potential application of this tool is based on the notion that the law of fiduciary establish a duty of loyalty between the two parties. Licht is writing that besides the regular trustee that are well known, well known like trustee, guardian, we can expand it into a relationship between someone who has some duty to another person. In our, in our term, from this point, we can at least think of a legal obligation between the owner of the media body and the regulator. Summary. And the short lecture I tried to raise the main question that I think rises from winning the indictment of the thousand cases. The main question that we should figure out how to answer if a journalist's work can be considered as a criminal benefit. The main difficulty is distinguishing between the journalist agenda of establishing and maintaining a relationship with politicians and potential, potential criminal benefits exchanged in the context of such a relationship. On the other hand, we can't ignore the power and the influence that the media has on the public opinion, especially when it's come to the political, political coverage, such as in the recent election in Israel and even in the midterm election in the United States. To the end, I would like to uh, thank to Professor Wild for inviting me to speak and for all her uh, guidance and assistance, and thank you for listening. I commend you for being under the 20 minute. Okay, so um, we have some time for a discussion, so I invite the speakers uh, who want to uh, raise questions, and maybe 